an Archeodeath publication review. Well, welcome Archeodeathlings to this latest publication review. Because on Archeodeath on YouTube during the last nine, ten months, or however long it's been, nine months I think it is, I've been doing recorded videos. I have been dealing with some debates, I've been dealing with some sites I've been able to visit, although we're back in lockdown now, so I can't really do those. And one of the other things I've been doing is trying to give you little reviews of my past publications, uh, focusing specifically on my edited collections and on my one monograph. I've got a monograph and a whole host of edited collections that have st and, and edited journal special issues that I've been doing so that the videos together provide you a little sort of review of all of the different uh, sort of main publications that I've done over the last 20, 22 years or so. Um, I, I won't do ones upon individual book chapters, although I will, when I do a debate and there are relevant readings from my past research, I will also make reference to those. But we're cap catching up because I've done a couple of publication launches of new books and new outputs, but my last book that I haven't done is this one and this came out um, only 10 months ago digging into the dark ages early medieval public archaeology is edited by myself and Pauline Clark who at the time when we started the project was an MA student a master's post postgraduate taught student at the University of Chester and now is a postgraduate researcher at the University of Chester where I'm supervising Pauline and you can see learn about her work in another video on the channel where I, I have an interview with her in this in this though she she helps me ed she's focusing on her research on early medieval archaeology and this book is all about early medieval archaeology and indeed it's a first of its kind because while there's quite an established literature on uh, medievalism on the medieval and popular culture in 19th 20th and early 21st century popular arts and uh, the, the, the uh, politics of the medieval, the evocations of the medieval, there's been no dedicated study from an archaeological perspective exploring um, the, the, the many ways in which archaeology of the 5th to 11th centuries CE or AD um, interacts with the contemporary society in which we live and the, this book stemmed from a conference like all my other recent edited collections it stemmed from one of the University of Chester archaeology student conferences where my students presented and therefore it's distinctive in multitude a multitude of ways not only is a first public archaeology book addressing the early middle ages it's also the first of its kind that's open access um, with Archeo Press, and you can download it for free or you can buy it, um, depending on what you prefer. Um, the, the physical copy, I would say, is a, an impressive beast um, because in its pages it, it has it's rich in colour images. So it's it's really it, 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 I, the visual medium is important for these Archeo Press books. That's why we went with Archeo Press because they would give us unlimited colour illustrations and you can purchase it for a price but you can download it for free but i would say that the the physical copy is worth getting hold of because it is a is a it's a, it's a striking beast it's my largest edited collection uh, 355 pages um and it contains a rich visual and um ar arguments and and uh, as well as um you know the, the the text itself and i would also say it's it, it's been a bit of a success because it in integrates many of the student contributions now this was the only student conference of the six that have ha happened because the six ones happening this month the five that have happened and the six ones coming um that, that we didn't video and the reason for that is that the politics and the pop culture of the early middle ages is 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 a very controversial area it involves issues of religion and racial politics and um, particular white supremacists and uh, far-right extremists and so we didn't I didn't want my students to be on video but they have published alongside me and alongside a series of um, medievalists and archaeologists and heritage professionals, I think an important collection of studies. And it was the first edited collection, not only includes student essays alongside um, pu publications uh, of, of by, by more established or experienced scholars, it also includes within its pages a series of interviews. So what I want to do is to give you a quick review of the book. You can look at this yourself in your own time and, and try and explain why it's an important topic. Now, this is a very timely 
topic because at the moment we see uh, an interleaving, almost an, a run, a movable feast of controversies and debates in medieval studies about its connections with gender, race, ethnicity and politics. And of course, I'm speaking to you a few days after the, the, the shocking events in Washington, D.C., where again paraded alongside national flags and various uh, political slogans and far right um, um, misuses of um, a host of symbols from the CERN Abbas giant through to um, um, Native American representations. We also saw the appropriation of, of, of early medieval symbols, including Viking or Norse symbolism, associated both with modern day practice, practitioners of, 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 of Asatru and uh, of heathenry, uh, but also um, being used um, by uh, neo-Nazis. So we, we see um, this is a timely and just, uh, important topic that archaeologists explore not simply a few headline examples of politics and controversy, but the broader ways in which our research into the early Middle Ages through archaeological means um, throws up ethical, practical and political challenges for us. So I introduced the book after a foreword by Dr Chiara Bonacci of the University of Stirling, who's one of our leading experts in digital public archaeology, and Chiara's introduction really sets up the book. I then provide an introduction with my students exploring the public archaeology for the Dark Ages. And of course, the use of the term Dark Ages in this book is being used sort of ironically as a popular sort of connection point to the many fantasies and uh, delusions that people spin around these centuries, um, linking pseudo-archaeology, Arthuriana and, and all manner of other things, Viking fantasies. Uh, and so I'm, we're using it in a critical way. That's why the book's called Digging Into the Dark Ages, not to um, use the term Dark Ages as a, if it's a problematic, a problem free term, but to critically evaluate that alongside other terminologies and concepts and problems. And then we split the book into three key areas. We have Dark Age Debates, which starts with an interview with Dr. Adrian Maldonado, Keeping the Dark Ages Weird, Engaging the Many Publics of Early Medieval Archaeology. So we did this interview uh, via Skype, uh, and then we, or whatever video connection we used, I can't remember now, I think it was Skype. And then we, we followed it up by me annotating it, passing it back to Adrian. Adrian's an expert in the early Middle Ages in Northern Britain, particularly the Picts. And uh, um, he's been working on the conversion um, of the Picts and later periods as well. But he's also been focusing on burial evidence. So he's a, he's a man after my own heart in that, that early medieval burial archaeology. And Adrian um, sort of explores the, the many challenges we face writing and researching early medieval archaeology in the present climate and really sets up the book. And then we have Dr. Anne Sassin, who explores the, uh, across a range of themes, looking at the public archaeology of um, dealing with colour and our stereotypes about the colouring of the early Middle Ages, the idea that it's a dark time with very little colour. Of course, all our material culture and our, our arts show us that it was a period rich in vibrant hues and colours. And so she explores this from early medieval sculpture to dress, accessories, to dress itself, to reenactors and education and TV, and explores the many stereotypes about the drabness of the Dark Ages. And that's a, um, so Adrian and Anne set us up with two to really expert introductions. Then we have a student essay by Sasha O'Connor looking at why do hell on helmets still matter? And um, given the fact that so many commentators in the last week didn't know the difference between a bison headdress and a horned helmet, shows, and, and of course that the Vikings didn't have horned helmets as far as we know, um, makes the point that there's still work to be done even in the academic community, let alone uh, amongst uh, the broader popular reception of um, of, of early medieval helmets and headgear and the stereotypes, the, the, the toxic masculinities, the hegemonic masculinities, the, the martial identities that are wrapped around those images, including ideas of white supremacy. So we have we, we have an exploration of, of that by Sasha, which I think is far ranging and takes us from Skyrim to Jarrow <laughs> and meant much else besides. And a second student essay by Matthew Kelly looking at public archaeology of early medieval assembly 
places and practices, looking at the case study of Thingvetlir in Iceland. And this is a topic, one, there's been a burgeoning literature on assembly places and practices in the early Middle Ages, and I've, I've, I'm, there's been some major key works come out. There has been no review of the public archaeology interfaces, of the romanticisation, the mysticisation, and uh, the nationalisms associated with um, assembly places and practices, the proto-democratic ideas that, that are spun out. And we have a former student then next, uh, Madeleine Walsh, who was published in the first student uh, volume, and one of my students who contributed to the Public Archaeology of Death book, where I co-authored a chapter with her looking at Sutton Who. She's back looking at dressing for Ragnarok, commodifying, appropriating and fetishising the Vikings. So um, we, she looks at everything from the consumerism to the museological aspects of the way we portray the Vikings um, in our popular culture and our heritage environments. Um, and so those are the debate section. That's part one of the book. We then have the public dark ages and a series of chapters look then at the ways in which we communicate the archaeology of the early Middle Ages. Um, Chris Tuckley starts us off with the Vikings of Jorvik, 40 years of reconstruction and reenactment, uh, a really important chapter that reviews the 40 years of emerging and evolving stories told at this premier heritage site in York, um, built over the site of the Coppergate famous Coppergate excavations um, and he reflects on the many um, strengths and challenges they faced over the years to tell the story of the Vikings right up to our time. So that's a really important chapter. And then we have a chapter that tries to look at the northwest of England's museums, displaying the Dark Ages in museums by myself, Pauline Clark, and a former student, Sarah Bratton. And we look at the, uh, w um, the Museum of Liverpool's displays of the early Middle Ages, and we also look at some of the um, church uh, churches in the area, and we look at the ref we reflect on also the Chester's Grosvenor Museum display um, of early medieval grave uh, stones and skeletons in a temporary exhibition. So we we try to look at how the many challenges with the stories, the the labels, the the, the narratives that we spin about the early Middle Ages in a museum context. Um, com which is actually one of the few pieces that's tried to do that because actually there's been very little museological literature or heritage literature on the interpretation of the early Middle Ages. So Chris's chapter and ours at least sort of set the ground, uh, firm footing for further work on, on that field. Then we have a chapter called Where History Meets Legend, presenting the early Middle Ages medieval archaeology of Tintagel Castle, Cornwall. Now this has been Susan Greener here with a really important chapter because in 2016 the uh, English Heritage revamped uh, Tintagel and included not only discussions of the early medieval archaeology and used the term Dark Ages as a, as a, as a term they thought at the time most appropriate for dis distinguishing the early medieval phases from the later medieval castle but also they incorporated discussions of the later legends surrounding Tintagel in in Cornwall and so uh, Greeny takes us through this really popular heritage site not only the new interpretations and heritage boards but but also the the new sculpture uh, of Merlin and the Gallos uh, kingly sculpture that was added to the um, island and she also reflects on the hashtag stop the dark ages movement by some historians and archaeologists to criticize the use of the term dark ages as a as they perceive it a very derogatory term and it is um to to refer to this 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 period so um that's a really interesting chapter and the fourth chapter in the section digging up the dark ages in cornwall the tintagel challenge and the st piran's oratory experience by jackie Nak nowakowski and uh, james gossip gossip sorry um, they, they, their chapter looks at two um, projects that dovetails with Susan's chapter. They look at Tintagel and how they did excavations as well as um, to reveal more of the early medieval archaeology of the site. And they found some fantastic new evidence and they look at the public engagement. I mean, it must have been the most visible, most visited archaeological excavations of the last decade, uh, the Tintagel excavations I visited in the summer of 2017, and the volume of people who got to see the archaeology coming out, to see new artefacts being discovered. It was amazing to see. Um, 
So wonderful. Um, and also the St. Piran's Oratory, uh, a site with national and uh, spiritual associations, um, the new excavations there and a funerary archaeology case study because they're finding human remains, excavating an early medieval chapel and uh, so uh, new discoveries, but also an, another project that involved local volunteers, local engagement and, uh, and, and, and uh, an important part of local identity or regional identity or national identity if you take a Cornish nationalist perspective. Staying with public engagement, then myself and Suzanne Evans look at Death and Memory and Fragments, Project Elise's Public Archaeology. And in this chapter, we reflect on the 2010 to 2012 archaeological fieldwork that I co-directed with my colleagues at Bangor University and the late Di Morgan Evans at and around the Pillar of Elise, this 9th century cross shaft fragment set in its original base on a early Bronze Age mound near Valley Crucis in uh, near Clangotlan. And in this chapter, we explore um, the monument, a very enigmatic monument, and the challenges of public engagement and um, how it has a distributed identity in different fragments and uh, elements, but also across multiple heritage sites and has various replications and evocations as far reached as the Office Dyke Centre in Knighton and Carnarvon Castle, um, where it, it forms a part uh, of the story of Welsh identity and origins and indeed our excavations contributed to that story. Then we have a really fascinating chapter by Roger Lang and Professor Dominic Powsland looking at reading the Gosforth Cross this is in Cumbria, enriching learning through film and photography. So this is where the, um, uh, Roger Lang, with Dominic's help, did um, a photogrammetry of the famous Viking Age Gosforth Cross and then told the story for, in a project to be used in um, primary schools so that's a really um, showing using 3d technology to, to to tell a story of a monument that's well known but poorly understood for local people but also on a national scale so that's a really wonderful paper and then we have our second interview paper crafting the early middle ages creating synergies between reenactors and archaeologists an interview with adam parsons and Stuart Strong and these are two living history experts and educators and archaeologists in the case of Adam and um, my interview with them was very far-reaching uh, exploring their work with the Cumbra Cumberland Living History Group and their work with schools how they tackle issues of far-right extremism and how they work with the media and uh, the significance of reenactment as a medium for engagement and education that takes us through to part three, Dark Age Media. And in this final section of the book, um, uh, we have a chapter by uh, Vic Victoria Nichols and myself looking at how the Dark Ages or the early Middle Ages is portrayed in two contrasting um, filmic versions or uh, t television versions. So the film Alfred the Great in 1969 and The Last Kingdom. Victoria is another of the students who presented at the conference. And we made the point that actually while there are some advances in the portrayal of the in the last kingdom actually alfred the great from the 1960s has more accuracy in in many regards in terms of its weapons and its brooches than the last kingdoms and even the ships uh, one could say they're they're comparable and uh, if if anything um, perhaps slightly better in some regards in in the 1960s so um we make the point, therefore, that actually there's no evolution towards a greater accuracy in the way the, t the, the televisual and filmic representations of the early Middle Ages play out. And actually, we're still dealing in many ways with 19th and early 20th century stereotypes in those popular media. Uh, Mark A. Hall writes a fantastic paper. It's the end of the world as we know it, uh, reforging Ragnarok through popular culture, looking at the Marvel um, representations and other representations of um, Ragnarok from the 19th century through to um, through to pop culture films so it's, it's a really a fascinating chapter um, and then we have an another interview with Dr Kat Jarman um, the hashtag great heathen hunt uh, Repton's public early medieval archaeology and Kat is now a, quite a celebrity in early medieval um, circles through not only her forthcoming book the the river kings uh, but also her, through her uh, ongoing work at Repton, her public archaeology work, and she looks at her work with uh, Professor Mark Horton, Michael Hurst, and other famous <laughs> individuals turning up, her appearances on Digging for Britain with Professor Alice Roberts, all the different ways in which she engaged her research with the media. 
Um, and I think that's a really important case study of how she gives us some real tips and how, not that I can do it, but how how we can do that kind of high level TV engagement and still have integrity in the research questions we ask. Matt Thomas, another of my students, writes then a really fascinating paper called Vikings and Virality and looks at um, how um, we can explore archaeology through Google questions and responding to questions and popular hits and suggesting there's there's ways in which viral news stories can provide a, an inspiration for us to think again about how we engage with the public or publics. Old Norse in the Wild West, Digital Public Arc Engagement on YouTube. Now this is an interview again with uh, Dr Jackson Crawford who is a bit of a YouTube celebrity and educator um, on, on topics of Old Norse and while his work hasn't been primarily about archaeology he has tackled runic monuments, runic inscriptions such as the uh, myth busting, the continued need for myth busting the Kensington runestone but also talking about archaeological finds in relation to his themes of his Old Norse channel. And so with uh, Jackson very generously gave up his time, as did Kat and Adrian um, and Adrian and um, and Adam and uh, Stuart to explore the philosophy behind his YouTube channel and how he's developed his YouTube channel to educate and entertain about Old Norse society, language and culture. Then we have a chapter by uh, Wolfgard the Bard in anonymous form, uh, the image horde, using the past as a palette in discussing the politics of the present. And this, this reflects on an archaeologist who's put a lot of uh, time into creating a visual medium, sort of drawing off the Bayeux tapestry uh, and fictional characters Donald the Unready to um, critique uh, Donald Trump and contemporary politics in America using the Make Mercy a Great Again slogan, sort of... Um, and um, drawing off various early medieval monuments in, in, in so doing. So we have um, another example of the synergies between archaeology and contemporary politics there. And the afterword of the whole book, um, Whose Dark Ages, by Bonnie Efros, Professor Bonnie Efros at the University of Liverpool, really reflects on our roles and responsibilities moving forward in the early medieval archaeological study of the Dark Ages and its public engagement and education aspects. So I hope this little review of the book uh, is of some use to you. Obviously, you can look at it yourself. You can download it for free. And, and we're very proud of the cover, even. And yes, it does still smell new and fresh. And um, while I, knowing the way that uh, archaeology works, I don't think this will get the attention it deserves, um, even though um, people are, are busy talking a lot about the political and pop cultural interactions with the early Middle Ages, from Assassin's Creed Valhalla to, you know, the um, uh, you know, the contemporary appropriations in in, uh, in fiction and in fantasy and in uh, QAnon, uh, uh, um, you know, sort of conspiracy theories. Um, the, the, the you know the, the many intersections are not all but they're not all negative and that's the point this book makes is that there's many positives there's many ways in which we can capture the imagination engage rich and varied and new audiences with the early middle ages as well as having to combat and confront extremist appropriation so there's many ways in which while our subject has a deep and troubled past of um, telling stories that are tarnished and and embedded uh, with sort of imperialism colonialism and nationalism there's many ways we can use the early middle ages to tell rich and exciting new stories and and, and i think many of the chapters in this book show us the ways in which we can do that so thank you archaeo deathlings for listening uh, check it out for relaxing times make it archaeo death time